Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Las Vegas. It is wonderful to be together both virtual and in person. My name is Margaret. I am your worship associate today, and I use they, them pronouns. Our worship leader is Nina, who uses she, her pronouns. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever you believe about life's journey, you are welcome here. We broadcast a video feed for our virtual attendees. If you wish not to be recorded, please sit toward the back or sides of the sanctuary. Today, during Of Our Hearts, we will read the name of anyone written in the book in the back of the sanctuary or in the chat. When we come together, we get to practice creating inclusive, worshipful spaces together. For those in our sanctuary, we encourage you to wear a name tag which includes your pronouns. For those in our virtual space, please edit your name to include your pronouns. Also, please silence your cell phones and refrain from using the chat on Zoom. Please also move in ways that your body needs. It's okay if you need to wiggle, stand up, sleep, or fidget. All bodies are welcome here. Welcome to our service. Before we ring the bell, please take a moment to greet everyone present here. This can be a verbal greeting or a gesture of acknowledgement. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Las Vegas is situated on the traditional homelands of the Nuuvi Southern Paiute people. We are grateful for the land itself, for those who have stewarded it for generations, and for the opportunity to worship, learn, work, grow, and be in community with this land and her peoples. We encourage everyone present here to engage in continued learning about the indigenous peoples who continue to live on this land, including the Las Vegas Paiute tribe and the Mawapa Band of Paiutes, and about the historical and present realities of colonialism. It is important to recognize and appreciate the use of Southern Paiute land as part of our mission to become a welcoming and inclusive place for worship, spiritual enrichment, and exploration. Now please join with me in a moment of silence. Do we have any helpers for our chalice lighting? When we gather together, we light a, the chalice, a symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. The chalice reminds us that we are connected to a much larger religion tradition that stretches out of the past and reaches around the world and leads into our shared future. Now join with me. We light the chalice as a reminder that together we are a beacon in the desert. May its light lead the way to love, acceptance, and justice as we strive for personal and societal transformation. Hear these opening words by Victoria Weinstein. Divinity is our birthright. God nods to God from behind each of us. But let us remember, as Mr. Emerson said, divinity is behind our failures and follies also. In the silence that follows, let us pray that we may notice and accept the divinity of tiny things the divine of ordinary miracles, and even our awkward mistakes. 
in frivolous conversations with friends, in worldless companionship with a loved one, in the work that seems futile one day and resonates with meaning the next, in the shared meal, in the shopping list, in the peaceful sleep, in the simple procession of spring days. We pray this moment to keep tender vigil over our precious, imperfect lives, to know each one as a vessel, however cracked or broken, of the holy. So we may strive to recognize the indwelling presence of God in all people, in all living things, and even in ourselves. In the silence, may we open our hearts. So may it be, and amen. Our opening hymn is uh, number 123, Spirit of Life. Please join us by standing in body or spirit to sing with us. everyone. Good morning. How are you all today? Yes? Good. Amazing. So if you want to, I'd like to invite you to come up. If you want to hear the story from up here, you're also welcome to stay in your seat. But I have a story to tell you today. Now, this story is about two friends, one of whom lived out in the country. Beautiful expanses, rolling green hills, few houses, almost no neighbors. One day, they went to go visit their friend in the city, and the two of them decided to take a walk outside. Now, many of us live in a city where there are building next to building next to building and cars constantly driving back and forth, honking their horns, lots of noise, people yelling construction all the time. As these two friends were walking, the one from the country is going, oh, my head, it is so loud. And their friend said, I don't hear it. That's just the noise of the city. That's just the way it is. And the one from the country said, oh, do you hear that? There is a cricket. Do you hear the chirp? And the friend from the city said, there are no crickets here. That is just a car horn or the wind blowing between the buildings. I don't know what you're talking about. And the friend from the country said, no, no, look. And they walked over to a plant that was hanging out of a front yard. And the friend from the country reached inside and pulled out a small cricket. And the friend from the city said, how, how did you possibly hear that cricket? It is making such a quiet noise compared to all the joyful noises of a bustling city. The friend from the country turned and took some coins out of their pocket and let them fall to the floor. With that, everyone around them <gasps> turned and heard the sound. <laughs> and the friend from the country, as they picked up those coins from and put them back into their pocket, said, ah, I think really it is what we are paying attention to. <laughs> Thank you all. We will now ground ourselves in the present and honor the thread of humanity that connects us as living beings. 
If you are on Zoom and you have someone you would like held up in the chat, please add their name to the Zoom chat. As humans striving toward a beloved community, we have the privilege and responsibility to hold on to each other as we live the joys and sorrows of life. We take this sacred time to acknowledge the people that we hold in our hearts, that in sharing, our triumph and joy may be multiplied, and our pain and sorrow may lessen their sting. We will now partake in a common UU ritual of marking our joys and sorrows by dropping a pebble in water from a common source. The pebble signifies a lightness or burden on your heart, and the water represents the love and strength of our community to surround, support, and celebrate you. Today is a silent ritual, and if you have a name to lift, please write it in the book as you come up. We will read those names during the service. There is also a small bowl of lightly scented eucalyptus oil if you would like to anoint yourself to seal this practice. If you would like to participate, please come forward. All are welcome. Margaret will now drop a pebble into the bowl for those who are participating remotely, and a second pebble for those who wish to do so anonymously. We hold you two in our hearts. Today we hold up Connie Chen, Dave Veter, Leslie DeCruz, George Early, Chandra DeMont, Alicia Brown, Karen, who lost her mom last Sunday. Grandma Betty. Jamie. Adam. The young Air Force officer. Avon. Melody. Gabrielle. Julius. Claudia. Danielle Odin. Wendy Losada and Autumn. Irma, is there anyone in the chat? Yes. Yes. The hair, the hair chin, chin family. family. George, George Early. Early. Nerissa, Nerissa and her, and her family. family. Connie, Connie Lucy, Lucy Ray. Ray. Chiara, Chiara Astor. Astor. Haley, Haley Vieira, Vieira, Gabrielle, Gabrielle Kuzniak, Kuzniak, Judy, Judy Johnson, Johnson, Ash, Ash Gardudu, Gardu, Shannon, Shannon, Vivian, Vivian Tiffany, Tiffany, and Antony. We hold a lot today. Know that as a religious community, we have a group of volunteers who can provide pastoral care, such as delivery of home-cooked meals, providing occasional rides, phone call checkups, and more. If you need assistance or you know someone who does, please reach out to them at uuclvcares at gmail.com. May we hold all that was spoken today and all that is kept in the silence of our hearts in love and compassion. Our meditation today is a singing meditation, and you won't be doing the singing, you'll be doing the listening. And I encourage you, as Margaret sings a song that's called Come and Find the Quiet Center, that you practice dropping in and finding your quiet center. And if it helps you to feel the physical chair on holding your body and your feet on the ground, you can do that. If closing your eyes will help with that, do that, or lower your gaze. Focus on your breath and softly try to find your quiet center. Frame 
We gather as a religious community to give each one of us a place where we can do the work of many. The offering supports the mission of the congregation to be a beacon of love and justice in the desert and supports local organizations working to make our community a better place for all. The offering this month is shared with Solidarity Fridge and the Little Library. The Solidarity Fridge is a new mutual aid initiative that is committed to, gather, to strengthening our community. Indigenous food warriors guided by their ancestors and rooted in community. Visit, volunteer, or donate to their community pantry, garden, seed share initiative, and the free library. This offering is a spiritual practice of generosity that this congregation does as a whole each week. Please join us as a member or friend in this practice. The link to donate your offering will be in the chat on Zoom and our ushers will pass plates where you can donate. And now, please join with me. With gratitude for the abundance in our own lives, we give for the life of this congregation and the benefit of the larger community. We thank you all for your gifts of treasure. The reading today is Choose to Bless the World by Reverend Rebecca Ann Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, 
the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, and waiting, any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And while there is injustice, anesthetization, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting, that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice will draw you into community, the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of the earth, the chorus of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. Okay, it's gift box time. And this is an extra exciting gift box time before, because before we even open the gift box, we're gonna sing the new gift box song. <laughs> there is a gift box song. So a couple weeks ago when I was doing gift box, I sat down here and I said, we should really have a gift box song. And then the next Sunday, Kay handed me a gift box song. And now we have it. So what beautiful proof that sometimes all you have to do is just ask for something and then it appears. So we're going to practice singing the gift box song. And this is how, it's very easy. Those are all the words on the screen. And we're going to listen to the tune one time through. Kay's going to play it on the piano. And then we'll sing it all together two times through. Yeah? is that? So nice. Thank you, Kay. I'm going to start making some more musical requests out into the ether. Um, all right, so we start with a, with a shake.
couple pieces of cardboard. Okay. Leo? I don't have a guess. Okay. All right, let's open it up. Seeds. What kind of seeds? Um, peas, carrots, tomatoes. Tomato. Yep. Peas, carrots, tomatoes. I have some seeds in here. Do you know what the name of today's service is? It's on the front of the order of service. Do you remember what it is? What? Growing in the reign of divinity. We're going to get into the divinity part a little later. But let's focus on the reign piece now. What are the things that, what are the things that seeds need to turn into plants? Water. Water. Water and sun. sun. And, and dirt. And dirt. Fertilizer. Yeah. That's right. And so in order for any... And love. And, and love. Yeah, they've actually found that plants grow happier yeah. if you... If you, if you, like, comment them, like, nicely and stuff. Yeah, yeah. If you sing to them. Yeah. If you talk to them nicely and you care for them and you nourish them, then and you sing to them, then what do you get after you plant this little seed in some soil? What happens? A big, beautiful, strong plant. A big, beautiful, strong plant. That's right. Nothing naturally on its own, by itself, in the dark, in a corner, is big, beautiful, strong, nurtured, vibrant. We all need things to get us to that, right? We all need things that feed us so that we can, okay, these aren't, these aren't maracas though, they are seeds. <laughs> Although we, we have been talking about needing some more musical instruments. And we need to invest in some of those too. But we, the story here is that we all need things poured into us and poured onto us so that we can become the best version of ourselves. Mel, in order for you to grow into a beautiful, vibrant human that is passionate about the world, what are the things that you think that you need? I think that I, I think that I need some love, and I need some, I need something like I need some acceptance, maybe from mm -hmm. my dad, maybe, because my life hasn't been really great. So mm -hmm. recently, I'm trying art therapy. So I have my iPad. That's wonderful. So some things you said: love, acceptance, knowing that the people around us love us, right? Sometimes when we're not doing so well, having other people or things come in to help us, right? Yeah. How about you, Alana? What are some things that help, um, that help you become the best version of yourself, the most beautiful, vibrant version of yourself? Uh, friends, love, um, family. Those are great answers. Friends, love, family. So just like seeds need water and soil and kind words said to them and sunshine in order for them to be able to grow into vegetables or flowers or plants or trees. We all need things that pour into us so that we can become the best version of ourselves. Another thing is sometimes we do need those people who aren't the best to us so we know what, how nice it is and how it feels to actually be loved or else it, you might take it for granted. It's kind of like the idea of all you, all, if all you ever ate was like cotton candy and mac and cheese and chicken nuggets and junk food and snack food and sugar, right? It would taste really good. It would feel really good at first. But then what would happen to our bodies eventually? We wouldn't feel well, right? They might get gross. We might feel gross. Right. So... that we didn't like so much to make the other stuff feel better. Yeah. So it's never just one thing that pours into us to help us grow, right? It's lots of different things. And some of them taste more like broccoli, and some of them taste more like cotton candy, right? Sometimes it's the hard rains that come down that nurture our plants and let them grow. Sometimes it's the beautiful sunshine. Uh, it's a blend of all those things. And I actually have, I didn't bring them out because they didn't fit in the gift box, but I have some potting soil and have some little cups. So if we want to actually plant these seeds later in the fellowship hall, we can do that and grow some stuff together, okay? Great, thanks. <laughs> now I want to have a sermon song. 
what's in the sermon? <laughs> it feels that a couple times a year, we happen upon a season that surely concerns humanity's search for divinity dwelling in the world. Raised in the Lutheran faith, the silent and eager awaiting of Advent was an early lesson on holiness for my young system. I recall sitting around the Advent wreath in my grandmother's living room, pushing my small fingers into the deep pile carpet and gazing intently into the candlelight while powdered sugar from Christmas cookies still dusted my lips. Years later, as my personal yoga practice transformed, I began to practice Tratika, which is an ancient meditation used in Ayurvedic medicine that involves staring directly into candlelight to hone focus, awareness, and cultivate inner peace. Two different lifetimes, the same Nina being transfixed and transformed by candlelight. And there is much about this season that we're in right now that hearkens the divine. For many, this is a time of quiet introspection and renewal. Those observing Lent and Ramadan are fasting, praying, and reflecting. It's a time of devotionals and communing with one's individual experience of holiness. It's a time of sacrifice, resurrection, revelation, and return. It's a lesson in the words of Sophia Faz of someone's words and deeds outliving their physical body. A prophet, a story of a prophet with a fallible human body, but a spirit that never needs to die. These are the stories and myths that are made divine again and again because we keep telling them, because we continue to be nourished by them, because we keep them alive. As spiritual people, our definition of the divine ranges from the minimal, this idea that divinity dwells only in one person, like Jesus Christ, to the maximal, practices of pantheism, which is the experience of divinity being encountered everywhere. Our Unitarian heritage certainly tends toward the latter end. It is our Unitarianism that finds evidence of God, or source, or spirit, or all, or oneness, or Gaia, within the natural order of the universe. As Walt Whitman put it, to me, every hour of light and dark is a miracle. It is our Unitarian heritage that helps us arrive at an understanding of God in the experience of things that free us of our lesser angels and edify our dignity and our worth. And we know a God by many names. In fact, the Unitarian Universalist Association offers a list of al almost 100 words and phrases that come from our hymnals that speak to that which is unspeakable, an attempt to define that which induces wonder, awe, and reverence. And we're going to look at a couple of those words here right now. So I know it's really small on the screen. We're going to have a couple handouts going around in case you want to look at it up close. But I'll read a couple out loud for you. So this includes transforming grace, voice within, blessed radiance, music of the spheres, hope undaunted, wonder of wonders, power of hope within. Lots of options and lots of attempts to define God for Unitarian Universalists. So when I say divinity, what moves within you? Maybe the word God elicits a shrinking sensation or a reminder of past trauma. But I wonder, do any of these words resonate with you? Do they reach that fertile ground within you that is ready for or practiced at nourishing the gifts that you bring to the world. Over the past three weeks, I've had four different people come to me and say something along the lines of, I have felt called lately to return to God, except I don't believe in God. Or, I feel like spirituality used to be such a big part of my life and it's just dried up. 
I think part of the reason that they turn to me with this is because they know I'm in divinity school and I do my best, my best to ask tender questions and hold space for their thoughts and invite them into experiences that they may find nourishing. But what I really want to say to them is, that's so interesting because lately I felt called to return to God, except I don't believe in God. <laughs> And plus, God is a metaphor that holds a meaning for an abstract existence that is both within and beyond us, and pre-exists and exists within the construct of time, and both is and is not gender as we understand it in the world and the binary and blah, 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 blah. Because that's what I'm good at as a Unitarian Universalist. I can intellectualize the idea of the divine. I can stand up here and talk about welcoming you whether your God is a metaphor or God doesn't work for you or you have a personal God that moves with you. I can preach about the gap between what the world does in the name of God and what the spirit of God is. I can point at myriad examples of communities whose practices aren't inclusive or diverse enough for us. I can put us on a pedestal for having, in our obsession with the written word, gotten closer to an inclusive understanding of the divine than many others. And in reality, all that intellectualizing just creates greater gaps between me and the people of the world that I want to love well. That's just me gatekeeping God, mediating someone and their experience of the divine. But meeting someone right where they are in the spirit of love, peace, and justice, that is moving with the divine. Moving toward love, peace, and justice within myself, that is moving with the divine. In considering the divine by our community's more expansive standards, I think of some of our progressive and brave ancestors. In his address at Divinity College, Ralph Waldo Emerson invited Harvard graduates to refuse the good models, even those which are sacred in the imagination of men, and dare to love God without mediator or veil. The year was 1838, and conversations about self-reliance and intuitive spiritual experiences were arousing controversy among communities who were accustomed to hierarchy standing between churchgoers and the divine. That was nearly two centuries ago, and yet they navigated so many of the same issues our communities grapple with today. Emerson spoke of a decaying church and a wasting belief. He spoke of creeds passing away without anything sufficient to replace them. All concerns, I think, that easily offer modern day likeness. Despite being a graduate of Harvard himself, Emerson rejected the materialistic philosophies taught at the institution and instead encouraged something that we are very familiar with here, personal experiences of transcendence. Margaret Fuller, another darling of progressive intellectual American history, trailblazed from childhood, advocating for the equality of the sexes. Despite being a bastion of brilliance herself and an intellectual sparring partner for many of the men who were attending Harvard at the time, including Emerson, she was unable to attend Harvard Divinity because she was a woman. Instead, she established places where women could discuss issues of ethics, education, theology, fine arts, and classical mythology. These salons that she created often used the same books that were being discussed at the capital D Divinity School. Margaret Fuller believed that society should be directed by the divine obligation of love and mutual aid between human beings. She serves from us as an example of someone who had found the singular light of her own particular star and blazed a new trail for her own life and the future of all society. Previously, from this pulpit, I argued that defining awe and wonder is a futile and reductive exercise. But now, just honestly a couple months later, I think that maybe the act of crowdsourcing, sharing, and inviting divinity and wonder is actually just another way of breaking bread together. 
When I walk into old Catholic churches, I feel the same kind of holy presence that I do walking in Alaskan summer twilight, which is the same kind of astounding gratitude and overwhelm that washes over me when I hear stories about my unborn niece tumbling in my little sister's belly. And the same kind of abundant love I felt holding my grandmother's soft hand as we walked through St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna together. It's that feeling that accompaniment that tells me that despite being insignificantly small, my existence is a miracle. Maybe you feel this way when you're alone in nature, or in cemeteries, or in spaces of historical significance, or when viewing grand architecture, or staring at the ocean, or maybe looking out of an airplane window right after you've taken off. Our human experience of attempting to make sense of the miraculous nature of existence is a tie that binds us together. And it is nourished every time we turn our faces toward the experience of the divine, both within us and outside. This is also a season of rain, renewal, and return. In February, we broke the daily rainfall record for the Las Vegas Valley. And I was delighted for many nights in a row to turn off my sleep machine and its artificial rain sounds and instead crack my window and hear real rainfall. As the weather rolled through the valley, I gazed in wonder at the magnificent clouds cresting and rolling over the craggy mountains that form our valley's natural western barrier. The snow that capped even the lowest elevation mountains. The dog bowl in the backyard overflowing with rainwater the small green sprouts arising in the previously neglected planters. The typically parched land was momentarily softened and awakened, and in return has begun offering wildflowers, tremendous pops of color and shape growing in cracks in the sidewalk and along the side of the street. A reminder that tremendous beauty and softness can spring from stoic, resilient places when it's struck with an unexpected gift. The degree that I'm working toward right now, does anybody know what it's called? What is it? Yeah, ministry, right. And the degree of, that leads someone toward ordained ministry is called a Master of Divinity, which I still think sounds so much like a degree from Hogwarts. <laughs> and I'm mad I haven't gotten a wand yet. Uh, but really, it's a path of study established in the 16th century when the Roman Catholic Church decided that there needed to be more formalized education for the formation of priests. They called it the seminary. And does anyone know the etymology of the word seminary? <laughs> seedbed. It literally means, quite literally means seedbed. Yeah a place where little bits of potential are planted and nourished so the work of divinity on earth can be done. We need not be born fully actualized. We arrive to this earth soft and squishy and full of our ancestors' dreams and entirely reliant on others to ensure our survival and growth. We trust that through their care, we will be sustained so that we may unfold into the best version of ourselves and grow to sustain others. Augustine said that at the Eucharistic celebration that Catholics and many Christians participate in, Catholics receive what they already are, the body of Christ, so they may become what they receive, Christ present in and for the life of the world. Things like love, grace, forgiveness, and belonging often surpass understanding. There is rarely an objective scientific explanation for the most transformational moments that act as the cornerstones of our lives. By turning toward the divine and loving others to do the same, we are able to receive the love, grace, belonging, and forgiveness that already exists within us, mirrored back by others in a sacred affirmation of interdependence. Emerson ended his Harvard address by calling the young theologians to action. What shall we do in this despondent time of uncertainty? What shall we do when the systems that we trusted to faithfully light our path have grown too dim and too dull to serve their purpose? When the clarion call of the future 
demands that we break our binds to the past. The remedy, he says, is first, soul. Secondly, soul. And evermore, soul. May our relationship with the divine be renewed by our own everyday experiences of transcendence. May it evoke in us a deep empathy and love for the world, especially those who experience it differently than we do. May it stoke our internal fires and move our hands to do the work of justice and peacemaking. May the mediator and veil that separates us from the divine fall away. And may our lives be a seedbed nourished by the tender and transformative reign of divinity. May it be so. Our closing song is number 34, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire. Please rise and body your spirit. Do we have any, oh, excuse me. The religious education team is getting ready to announce the spring activity. In the month of April, we invite you to join our Spirit in Practice programming. Spirit in Practice was created to help Unitarian Universalists develop regular disciplines or practices of the spirit. Practices that help us connect with the sacred ground of the being. However, we understand it. Spirit in Practice affirms religious diversity while, while seeking unity in our communal quest for meaning and wholeness. Whether participants follow a path they identify as humanist, Jewish, Christian, pagan, theist, atheist, agnostic, mystic, or any other paths we follow in our diverse congregations, the Spirit in Practice workshops offer a forum for learning, sharing, and growth that can enrich their faith journeys. Information will be circulating starting in this week's flash and out in the social hall, there will be sheets of paper with QR codes that you can uh, scan to find more information. Additionally, you can ask Nina, Mark, Rory, Elaine, or Ariel if you have any questions. As we go today, may we open ourselves ever more fully to that eternal mystery which lures us onward toward life and creativity. May we find the courage to live our faith, to speak our truth, and to strive together for a world where freedom abounds and justice truly rolls down like water. May we know the fullness of love without fear and the serenity of peace without turmoil. May we hold one another in the deep and tender places with compassion 
and may we grace one another by sharing our own vulnerabilities, being ever mindful of the divinity within that makes soulmates of us all. Do we have any helpers for the chalice extinguishing? And now join with me. We release that which is called with love and gratitude as we extinguish the flame, but not our commitment to being a beacon in the desert. Spurs brightly until we gather again. We have room for three announcements to be read at upcoming services. If you want your announcement read, please email Irma by Thursday and she will get it to the worship associate. Please include the name of the event, the date and time, a contact name, and no more than a 30 word description. We have two events today after the service. Today at noon is the first Sunday lunch bunch and they are dining at the Desert Pines Golf Course where members and friends of UUCLV discuss all the critical issues facing us and resolve all the world's problems. Come join us. For more information, please see Betty Lacombe. Also today after the service in the library is the next Article 2 discussion. Come see what the hubbub is all about and discern your own position ahead of the final vote at this year's General Assembly. Coming up later this week, the Tarot Club meets on Friday, March 8th, from 5.30 to 7.30 here uh, at UUCLV. Please see Ariel for more information. Finally, Breeze is our church database where we collect names, contact information, and other important details about all of the members and friends of UUCLV. And we want this database to be up to date to be sure that our information and communication preferences are correct. Along with the QR codes uh, for the spirit in practice uh, out in the social hall, there are also QR codes available to check that you are correctly signed up for Breeze and that all of your information is as you would like it. In addition to the few we have highlighted, there are many more announcements and events this week and in the coming weeks. To see them, head over to our webpage using the QR code on screen or visit uuclv.org. Thank you for being with us today. Next Sunday, join Kem and Nina for a service on inspiration and inclusion.